This week is once again split between General Sherman in Georgia and General Grant in Virginia, as both hopefully use the cost of battle to exhaust and beat their opponents into submission. Though the continual warring has brought weight to the heart of the citizens, they sorrow and fear some hope to take advantage of. This week is the follow-through of the aggressiveness of the new command. That question, is it enough or is it suicide? Last week I told you of a threefold Union raid. Who decides if it is a massive success or a disappointing failure is Major General Franz Sigel in his Department of West Virginia. Fitz is down the valley, but the rebels won't wait for him. Major General John C. Breckenridge brings about north. The Virginia Military Institute cadets under Lieutenant Colonel Scott Ship are in Breckenridge's command. They are held far back as Breckenridge desperately tries to get the Lee Union Brigade under Colonel Moore to attack. Artillery and cavalry can't get Moore to move. Union is in a good position, and they know it. Soon reports come to Breckenridge of federal reinforcements. The time has come to start the battle. The Greybacks charge the federal line, and through the rifle fire, they push more back. After a short break to reform ranks, the rebels continue their charge. The Union line holds firm and blasts apart the center. Four cadets are holding the supply train under their guard, when the sound of battle calls them forward. Cadet John Wise speaks to the others. Gentlemen, the enemy is not a front. We are about to engage him. I like fighting no better than anybody else, but I have an enemy in my rear as dreadful as any before me. In the front, we may or may not be hurt. But if I go home and tell my father that I never went into this action, there is no doubt as to my fate. I know he will kill me. With worse than bullets. Ridicule. I shall go at once. Anyone who chooses to remain may do so. At this point, Breckenridge calls in the VMI Cadet Battalion. Ship yells as he and his boys, and I do mean boys, move forward forming the reserves of the battle line. Young gentlemen, I hope there will be no occasion to use you. But if there is, I trust you will do your duty. Pennsylvania cannons notice this and open fire. Even under cannon shot, the cadets well-drilled calmly advance. They're each offense and form up. They then watch a grisly sight as artillery shells strike veteran Virginia infantry. These veterans do push more back as he withdraws his advanced infantry. The Union falls back closer to their heavy guns. The bullets fall up and pour fire to the blue line. It falls back, but doesn't break. Our line holds, allowing for the artillery to reform on the roads. When their Confederate fire, a cannon is lost. Sigil, by now, has arrived on the scene and has reinforced more. This repulses the Confederate force and afterward are able to reform. By now, both sides have arrived and survived their baptism of fire. Colonel Joseph Thoburn takes over the Union front from Colonel Moore. The sides resupply and continue the duel of fire. The Confederates again press on Sigil's formation and the New York cavalry is sent in. They engage with their carbines, but it's only a short time till Major General Julius Stahl, the cavalry division commander, orders a saber charge. This is blasted apart by the VMI's artillery. <laughs> Low double cancer shot. Breckenridge's cavalry is also rendered useless, not by cannon nor musket, but by a flooded creek. The 54th Pennsylvania advances and breaks the center. Rebel regiments flank and force the Keystoners back, but the gap in the rebel line is there. Major Charles Simple brings this report to Breckenridge. General, it is too late. The Federals are right on us. The cadets are ordered up. We can close the gap. Put the boys in and may God forgive me for the order. The Virginian students summon their strength and charge. Immediately, three fall to a shell. Another falls dead by a mini ball to the chest. Union gunfire takes its toll, wounding many others. So many are injured. The order goes to stop giving medical attention and just ignore them. Some dismiss this order, ensuring no man is left behind, saving many. Then Lieutenant Colonel Ship is hit by shrapnel. Cadet Moses Ezekiel runs to him. Ships turns over command to Captain Henry A. Wise, bring that his maiming doesn't slow the advance. Wise is a pious and proper commander in the classroom. On the battlefield, his trousers get shot off and he curses like a sailor. The battle is turning against Breckenridge. His regiments are breaking under the constant murderous cannon rifle fire, especially the cannon fire. Those Union guns must be silenced. And there is a way. The 54th Pennsylvania has been broken and the road is clear. A quick charge and it should be over. Get up from here and give the Yankees hell. The VMI cadets leave the safety of the fence. They took cover behind and cross a field of mud, using their shoes in the sludge. The ranks are blasted apart, but they continue their advance. Federal cannons are forced to withdraw, but two blue regiments charge in and engage in melee with the cadets. The VMI is able to capture a heavy gun, and four others fall to other units. Sigil seeing this and running low on ammunition, surrenders the field. Sigil lost Sigil lost 96 KIA, 520 WIA, and 225 MIA, 841 total. 
Breckenridge lost 43 KIA, 474 WIA, and 3 MIA for 520 total. Sigil was replaced in command by Major General David Hunter, and 10 VMI cadets lost their lives and are forever memorialized. The affair is depressing. The Union bungled an opportunity to take the Shenandoah Valley, cut we off from supply, and children died for a treacherous cause. What a terrible war. May 18th, New York City. The Journal of Commerce in New York World published an associated press report that Lincoln was calling for 300,000 more soldiers. Within the day, the offices of the Journal and World are occupied. This report is fraudulent. Secretary of War Stanton, under orders from President Lincoln, immediately begins an investigation. The night before, numerous papers got the AP report, but one that didn't was the Tribune, and that's a big deal. Because of this, neither the Times nor Daily News feels confident in it. The New York Herald, upon realizing that the Tribune and Times aren't publishing the report, destroy all of their copies and remove it from the front page. Before this, General John Adams Dix arrests the World and Journal. Two papers realize their mistake and begin a recall. What is happening? The report is a fake. The AP never published this. It's a forgery. It becomes known that the culprits of this forgery are actually from the New York Eagle, the reporters Joseph Howard Jr. and Francis Mallison. They bought up gold en masse and hoped that the fake report would drive down confidence in the dollar and have people panic by gold. This causes the local Democratic Party to protest, and Major General George McClellan is among the crowd. But the entire incident finally dies as the truth is revealed. Lincoln's heavy-handed response went further, arresting those even in D.C. Why? Because he is planning a similar proclamation and is trying to catch a leak. So the entire thing is a huge coincidence. What a weird story. Now to Louisiana, where Major General Nathaniel, he is the worst, isn't he? Banks is falling back. His forces skirmish at Mansura, coming under artillery fire. The Confederates fall back before the Army of the Gulf can do anything. Waiting for our Federals to reach the, oh god, Achafalia River. They're getting ready to cross when they spot General Richard Taylor's Confederates. This will be contested. Banks asks General Smith to act as rear guard, and Smith tells General Mauer to do it. He charges forth and strikes back the rebels. Confederates give ground under the ferocity of our men. They do reform and counterattack. Mauer recoils, but brings forth his artillery loaded with canister and repulses the rebels. The trees catch fire, and both sides disengage. The Union lost 350, but inflicted 608. They are able to fall back out of Taylor's reach. Thus ends the campaign. Banks returns his men to Sherman a month after he should, and he has suffered 5,545 losses, the rebels 4,275. In addition, an ironclad, two tinclads, three transports, a pair of pump boats, and 28 heavy guns. Banks is limited to administration for this disaster, which he is good at. General Edward R. S. Camby takes over the military division of West Mississippi, the combat portion of the command. Banks is incompetent, but this is an election year, and Banks has political pull. But he is sad and worn. He has no heart left in him. He was supposed to march on Mobile, Alabama, but no men will walk with him. Men his junior in age and rank now lead what he once had. Banks has lost in the field and the political realm. Now for the Bermuda 100 campaign. I am compelled to return to our friends at the Chesterfield Historical Society, mainly because they are my best sources and I love their videos. Brigadier General Alfred H. Terry's division moves to flank Woolridge Hill. The 10th Corps attacks from Redwater Creek with Terry's division. Brigadier General Matthew Ransom abandons the Woolridge Hill defenses. That evening, the Confederates withdraw to their inner line defenses. General P.G.T. Beauregard arrives at Drury's Bluff with Colquitt's Brigade. On the morning of May 14th, the Army of the James advances against the Confederate skirmish line. The Army of the James halts when confronted with the Confederate inner line defenses. The Federals dig in and plug gaps in the line. That evening, Major General Robert Ransom's division returns to Drury's Bluff. Major General Butler's plan for the morning of May 15th was to attack a weakness in the Confederate line with the 18th Corps. On May 15th, the Army of the James brings up reserves and prepares to attack. The Federal attack is canceled and the Army of the James prepares to defend. 
That evening, Ransom's and Whiting's divisions move into attack positions. Beauregard's plan for the morning called for Hoke's division to demonstrate in front of the Federal left to hold it in place. Ransom's division would attack the Federal right and turn its flank. Whiting's division would march to the sound of the guns and close off the Federal route of retreat. Beauregard's plan would leave the Army of the James caught in a trap with no escape route except to retreat away from its base. In a heavy fog, Major General Robert Ransom's division attacks the Federal right. The Federal right bends but holds as Ransom's attack falters. While Ransom attacks the Federal right, Whiting begins to move to Drury's Bluff. Hoke attacks the Federal center with Johnson's and Haygood's brigades. The Federal center holds as Johnson's and Haygood's flanks are thrown back. Ransom attacks to support Haygood's left and is repulsed. Beauregard commits Colquitt's brigade from the reserve to close the gap between Hoke and Ransom. Colquitt attacks the Federal Center and is repulsed. Hoke attacks with part of Klingman's brigade as two regiments from Corse's brigade arrive. While Johnson and Haygood attack the Federal Center, Whiting continues to move to Drury's Bluff. Hoke attacks the Federal left and is repulsed. Gilmore attacks with the 10th Corps and is repulsed. Smith, believing his corps to be badly damaged, withdraws the 18th Corps. Gilmore withdraws the 10th Corps under pressure. The Confederates reoccupy the Drury's Bluff fortifications. As fighting continued at Drury's Bluff, Whiting, unable to hear the sounds of battle and wary of being attacked, timidly approaches the Federal rear guard. Facing only light resistance from two regiments from Brigadier General Adelbert Ames' division, the Confederates advance, then pull back, and finally withdraw to Swift Creek. The Army of the James returns from the retreat at Drury's Bluff unhindered. But were bottled up and beaten allows Beauregard to bolster Lee, bringing him brigades in his time of need. Davis writes to Lee about the reinforcements. He gives him complete discretion. Grant is none too pleased about the failure of his flanking maneuver. He said that the general occupied a place between the James and Appomattox rivers, which was of great strength, and where, with an inferior force, he could hold it for an indefinite length of time against a superior, but that he could do nothing offensively. I then asked him why Boer could not move out from his lines and push across the Richmond and Petersburg Railroad to the rear and on the south side of Richmond. He replied that was impracticable, because then we had substantially the same line across the neck of land that General Butler had. He then sketched the locality, marking that the position was like a bottle, that Butler's line of entrenchments across the neck represented the court, but then he had built an equally strong line immediately in front of him across the neck, and was therefore as if Butler was in a bottle. He was perfectly safe against an attack, but as Bernard expressed it, they may have corked the bottle the small force could hold the cork in its place. On the topic of Grant, let's return to Spotsylvania, where the torrent of rain washes away the aftermath of the bloody angle. The wounded lay still, exhausted by the battle. The day sees little action as both sides make an eastern movement, the lines reorganizing. There are minor skirmishes at Myers Farm. Colonel Emory Upton, with 800 men, holds against two enemy brigades. When asking for reinforcements, he's only given two regiments. Meade rides to the farm to view the enemy, but the Union line breaks as he arrives. The commander is forced to flee. Meade orders a counterattack, but they find the hill unoccupied. The rebel is fleeing rather than fighting. Grant uses the night of the 13th to devise a new plan. He can't ask for another head-on assault. Instead, decides to bring his four corps in his favorite formation, a flanking maneuver on Lee's left flank. Lee receives an onslaught of communications from Davis. If possible, we'll sustain you when you're unequal so long and nobly maintained. 
Affairs here are critical. And upon hearing about Wee's love of risking his life by riding to the front, the country cannot bear the loss of you. The 5th and 6th Corps moved to the 9th Corps to prepare for a charge across the Nye River. We moves the 1st Corps to protect his flank. Grant closed off the attack and waits for reinforcements, asking the War Department for more troops. Untrained and drunken regiments are sent, but this isn't a real bolster. Grant then rats his mind for a plan, and on the 17th, he has it! A strike on Lee's left! At 0400 hours on the 18th, the attack is set to begin. General Wright is late, and a new 2nd Corps division made up of scraps struggles to form a line, but Hancock is able to assault at 0430 hours. Assault against strong entrenchments, and 24 cannons ready to destroy the earth before them. The blue coats surge forward, jumping over rotting corpses and the wounded. They become tangled in the abatis ring. When Grant receives word, he anguishes, as he also has news of Sigil and Butler. Everywhere he is hindered. Grant is done. He can't continue throwing his head against a brick wall. He needs to maneuver. He needs to get his army out of the hell it currently is, and he needs to flank Lee's left. He really loves that. One of the cannons are sent back to Washington to lighten the load. Lee sees this and senses weakness, and Yule is sent to attack Grant. They find the Green Men from D.C. at 1630 hours on the 19th and completely break them. They repulse the artillery men, but have no cannons to call trophies. Meade tosses more men forward, and Yule's column becomes a line. Finally, the rebels are outflanked, and they are forced back. Yule tries to strike elsewhere, but he makes no headway. 900 rebel losses to 1,500 Union casualties. This has bought Lee time to move ahead of Grant. He has 10,000 men from Beauregard, and AP Hill is back. But he doesn't know what is going on, and has to scramble when Grant starts moving. The Battle of Spotsylvania is another draw. The Union lost 2,725 KIA, 13,416 WIA, 2,258 MIA, for 18,399 total. Rebels, 1,515 KIA, 5,414 WIA, 5,758 MIA, 12,687 total. So many hurt, so many dead, for nothing, for nothing. Now we turn to Major General William Tecumseh Sherman in his southern operation. He has taken the Gibraltar of Georgia, but he now faces the gauntlet of Raysica. Johnson is reinforced by Lieutenant General Leonidas Polk, the Bishop General, the first Episcopal leader of Louisiana. He takes the position of second in command to full General Joseph Johnston. Sherman realizes what is happening. He knows the enemy is strong before him. He hopes they will fall back, but is unsure if they will. The land behind him is suitable terrain. Country roads make resupply easy. The ground before him, well, I'll let Brigadier General Jacob Cox say it. It required extraordinary exertions to take the artillery across the ravines and streams, which had to be passed. The 14th brings battle. Brigadier General Thomas Sweeney will take his division and secure a crossing of the Ustanawa, a river leading to the Confederate rear. This is called off as reports coming of an enemy crossing at Calhoun Ferry. The attempt to cut off the rebel line of retreat is a no-go, but Sherman still wants to bring battle. The battle plans call for a right wheel. It is a pivot through an arc of 130 degrees, or thereabouts, or, at any rate, to the works and position of the enemy, should be developed. 0900 hours. Virginal William P. Carlin leads his brigade forward. The 23rd and 4th Corps ate him, but they can't keep a straight line, owing to the extremely rugged characteristics of the ground. With a creek and 1,200 feet before them, they trudge along. Robles open against the Union. Carlin takes position by the creek. Close up the first Ohio light artillery, and the battle turns into an artillery duel that costs Carlin 200 men. Then I came into position on the ridge opposite to me, and opened a heavy fusillade. In the course of the afternoon, he made several attempts to charge. In the course of the afternoon, he made several attempts to charge. But uniformly, they were unhappy failures. When Major General Schofield's corps conducts the planned wheeling action, he gets blown apart. For General Jacob Cox and his third division, for me back well. The division on his right flank under Brigadier General Henry Judah is caught in the crossfire in the pulp. This leaves Cox alone, and the Rebel Corps of General Hood counterattacks. He holds, but under the constant charges, his men use up their ammunition. They're about to be overrun, and the 4th Corps comes to the rescue, as General Newton and General Wood bring in their divisions. The movement of the morning had crowded our forces too much to the right, and Howard's left was in the air. Sherman directs Major General Joseph Hooker to help out Howard. Hood sees this and sends out two divisions, Mayor General Carter L. Stevenson and Mayor General Alexander P. Stewart, to wheel against the Federals. This time, the disorderly ground works to our men's advantage, and Stewart's division becomes lost. General Stevenson charges in with his brigades. They find early success, breaking the infantry, but become blunted by the 5th Indiana Battery. 
Nobles charge in, but are repulsed. They reform, fix bayonets, and advance again. Those of the 45th, 143rd New York, and the 82nd Illinois sound from a nearby forest. Moved rapidly down the steep ridge, at the same time wheeling to the right, charged over the barricades and met the advancing rebels, opening heavily upon them. The surprise counterattack sends the Greys backward. Hooker has arrived. It has been checked for the 14th. The day should be over. But a brave Missouri Major General, Peter J. Osterhaus, has other ideas. He has orders to make a demonstration along the whole line, opening with all the guns. This is to scare Polk and keep him from reinforcing Hood or General Hardy. With this command, at 1730 hours, he takes Virginal Charles Wood's brigade and advances it. They charge across Camp Creek and take a nearby hill. This hill shows Raysica, the railroads, and the railroad bridges. Being only 1300 infantry, they have no artillery to commence a bombardment, asking for howitzers and ordnance rifles to be delivered by daybreak on the 15th. Rebels realize what this position means and try to push Woods off of it, but to no avail. The 15th morning is filled with confusion and counter moves. Johnson wants Hood to assault on the right, but he hears that Howard's Corps has just reinforced that exact line of assault, so he calls that off. Reports come in of Ostras' artillery, and in quick succession is he informed of Union troops across the Ustanala. Rebels advance against it, but these reports are late, referring to the aborted Union attempt, so the Confederates fall back. 1300 hours, the battle begins in earnest. Howard launches his attack. It is a disaster. Union suffers severe casualties. Virginal August Willich is wounded. Also wounded is General Ward, and Colonel Benjamin Harrison replaces him. General Hooker wished to keep the assault going with General Gary's and General Butterfield's divisions. Brigades become mixed, and the assault is haphazard. Many units are turned away under artillery fire from the Cherokee cannons. Harrison sees this, draws his saber, yells, Come on, boys! and leads the 70th Indiana in a charge straight to the rebel battery, overrunning the obstacle. These guns become the center point for the struggle as Harrison is counterattacked and beaten back, only for another Union commander to retake them. Rebels reform and reclaim the artillery, but under musket fire are forced to fall back, leaving these cannons in no man's land. General Sweeney ends the battle by crossing the Usnala River in earnest. Johnston, fearing for his line of supply and retreat, falls back. The Union suffered 2,747 casualties to the rebels 2,800. The only equipment lost were those cannons in no man's land. Sherman realizes Johnson is retreating when he spots the burning of the railroad bridges. Wishing to keep on the enemy's heels, he orders his men forward. Johnson escaped, retreating south across to Ustanala. General Thomas directly on his heels. General McPherson by Way's ferry. General Schofield by obscure roads to the left. Johnson tries to reform near Calhoun, Georgia. But action at Rome forces the rebels even further back. Johnson tries to trap Sherman at Adersville. There are two roads, one to Cassville and the other to Kingston. The probability that the Federal Army would divide, a column fall on each road, gave me hope of engaging and defeating one of them before I could receive the aid of the other. Sherman takes the bait, but a cavalry division scares Hood and keeps him from attacking the column. The story of Hood saves Sherman's columns. Johnston falls back to a ridge close to Cassville, and artillery and skirmishers keep Johnston pinned to this ridge till the night of the 19th, when he uses the darkness to fall back. He gets word from Davis, who expresses disappointment in the Army of Tennessee withdrawn. But Johnston will stand his ground, remains to be seen. Then there are Sickles, who was present at Racica with his excellent friend Hooker. Dan, you must go back. We want to save that other leg of yours. But Sickles couldn't see it. Where our soldiers were perilling their lives for the country, he chose to share their dangers. Maybe you saved the army at Chancellorsville. That's bully Sickles of Gettysburg. But Sickles isn't here to merely raise morale and sends word back to Lincoln of the battle. The retreat of the enemy from successive lines of fortified positions through 40 miles of mountains. If Georgia cannot be defended on its northern frontiers, it cannot be defended anywhere. Abandoned artillery, small arms, material, and substances. Sherman is already after him, and close upon his heels. That sure does make me feel better about this week. And that is where it ends. A shorter one than last, but still filled to the brim with action. From Grant's continuing his flaking attempts to break Lee's back, to the heartbreaking axe in the valley. What stands out is Sherman's Georgia campaign. It's missing something. A battle! Sure, there were the events of Rocky Face Ridge and Racica, but those weren't significant set-piece confrontations. Mainly, I cut out some of the movements and tactics from the actions at Calhoun, Rome Cross Roads, and Castle, but they were small and not worth your time, dear viewer. It seems that neither Sherman nor Johnson want a climatic confrontation, both trying to outmaneuver the other. The question is, who will fall into the other's trap? Time. It's the entire Civil War week by week team here, and this will be the final episode in this set.
literally a couple feet from my bed right there and my closet over there. This set has been a challenge. It's not what I was used to, but part of me will miss it. I will see you next week in St. Louis. The figurine conglomeration will stay. All the trinkets will stay. We'll have stuff on the walls, but I wouldn't be lying if something wasn't missing. Thank you, and I do hope to see you next week.